Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Stefan Levera podcast brought to you by Bold, the best place to buy, save and store your Bitcoin over at getbold.io. That's for American listeners, and they have a two of three multi-signature vault. Now, onto the show today. Joining me today is Harris Irfan. He is CEO of Cordoba Capital Markets, and he's also an advisor to OnRamp Mina, and he's also the author of Heaven's Bankers. So, Harris, first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks, Stefan. Great to be on. So, uh, Harris, I know you have an interesting uh, history and background with Islamic finance, uh, with also working in um, you know, conventional uh, banking and finance and coming from that world. And then, of course, you've also gone uh, into Bitcoin as well. So that'll be really uh, interesting to uh, get into also. But let's start with a little bit of your, you know, just a little bit of your background on finance and how the Islamic banking aspect came up for you. Yeah, well, I never thought I'd be in finance. I, I studied physics at university and I thought I would end up studying the stars from Palo Alto or somewhere. And, uh, and actually, I realized um, that when I got to university, these people around me are way brighter than I am. So I think uh, trying to compete with them to become an astrophysicist was probably not going to get me very far. Um, and I decided that uh, something in the city looked interesting. Uh, and in London, when we say, you know, something in the city, that's usually investment banking. Uh, but I started life as a as a management, a trainee management consultant, uh, and realized that the old saying of borrowing your watch to tell you the time is very true. Um, and I didn't really feel very fulfilled by doing that kind of work. And I looked into something called project finance. And project finance is the financing of infrastructure. So, you know, there's many things within banking which one might consider to be socially useless. And in fact, that's a term that was used by a former head of the FSA in the UK. Uh, but uh, I felt that project finance, which is the financing of infrastructure, ra- railways, roads, hospitals, schools, well, you know, that's kind of a noble endeavor. And I looked into it and, and I started working in a small British merchant bank, then moved across to Deutsche Bank in the late 90s. And um, they sent me to Dubai. They said, we'd like you to originate our corporate finance business out there. We'd like you to help open office there. And in fact, I was the first guy on the ground. So I arrived and you know, Dubai was very much in the very early stages of its uh, journey as an international financial center. And two days after I arrived in Dubai, you know, in a service department surrounded by boxes full of my belongings, 9-11 happened. And, you know, all of a sudden you have the situation where a lot of money, uh, a lot of capital owned by Gulf high net worth families starts getting repatriated to the Middle East because there's a lot of increased scrutiny of accounts in the US and the UK and elsewhere. And, you know, they wanted to just move their money back to the Middle East. And that saw local markets, uh, local real estate start taking off. The Dubai government said, let's create an international financial center. And Deutsche Bank was at the very beginning of that. And I just happened to be lucky enough to be the first Deutsche Banker on the ground. So there I am, you know, fairly junior to mid ranking banker, suddenly in the middle of this very exciting frontiers development. And there's this patch of desert out there, which is a, essentially a square mile, just like the square mile in the city of London. But it's it's clean, it's it's waiting to be built on. And we as their first investment banking advisor, we're, we're part of that process. And uh, you know we help them to build that international financial center. So of course, here I am sitting in Dubai in the Middle East, supposedly originating all of our corporate finance business. And You know, we've got clients coming to us and saying, let's do deals on a Sharia compliant basis. Can you help us with that? And we'd never done that business before. So I co-founded the Islamic finance team at Deutsche Bank. And we found ourselves, we hired actually one of the world's leading theologians, a guy called Sheikh Hussein Hamid Hassan. And he was considered to be the grandfather of the modern Islamic finance industry. So this is a man who is very highly trained in uh, not only in theology and Sharia law, but also uh, in uh, comparative law and also in finance and economics. So he had multiple positions on various Sharia boards at uh, Islamic banks in the Middle East. But this was the first time I think he had ever encountered, I guess, young, dynamic, Western trained investment bankers who were prepared to push the boundaries. Uh, you know, so up until then, Islamic finance had been a sort of sleepy backwater and you'd had very simple and mostly retail products um, and really nothing 
particularly sophisticated or complex. And all of a sudden you've got these investment bankers saying, what about if we started to create acquisition finance, leverage finance, structured investment products, hedging instruments on a Sharia compliant basis? Never been done before. So we started creating these things. And I think he enjoyed that, that dynamism and that um, sort of respectful pushback because the standard response that Islamic bankers would get from Sharia coordination departments who were the sort of gatekeepers to the scholars, the middlemen, was doctor says no, right? But they would never say doctor says no, and there's a way we think you can create this product. So here it is. So it was up to us to work out, to solve the, the puzzles. Because of course, investment banking is one of those few industries where people are paid for cleverness, for solving puzzles. You know, it could be, I don't know, tax structures in Luxembourg, uh, right? You give them a set of rules, a set of parameters, and they solve a problem. Hence why you often hire mathematicians and physicists to do these jobs. But here we had a different set of rules. So alongside the usual legal, commercial, and tax structuring, you now had Sharia law, right? And there's this body of jurisprudence within Sharia law called fiqal mu'amalat, which means the jurisprudence of commercial transactions, which is a pretty sophisticated body of law. And we had to solve the problem against those parameters. And, and really no investment bank had done that before. So, you know, it was, it was really genuinely creating a new industry. And we started creating these huge benchmark size sukuk transactions, which are Islamic bonds. So for example, the Dubai government through one of its uh, quasi government entities called Dubai Ports World, DP World, acquired a FTSE 100 company uh, called uh, PNO the ports and ferries operator. And it was a very large transaction. And we structured the very first exchangeable or convertible Sukuk, Islamic bond, which was, I think, a three and a half billion dollar issuance. Um, so, you know, really never been done before, quite sophisticated. You know, it was uh, paid in the form of a qualifying uh, public offering later on. So a convertible or an exchangeable. And, you know, this was the kind of deal that Deutsche Bank brought to the table 20 years ago. Uh, and I was very lucky enough to be a part of that. So I guess the Deutsche Bank part of my career where I spent 11 years is, is I guess, the most significant part of, of what we did, which was essentially creating a revolution in Islamic finance. I see. And so the perception might be that if you are trying to operate, you know, in today's fiat finance world with fractional reserve banking, that you know, anybody trying to do this kind of thing would be at a disadvantage. Is that true? Or what, what kind of, how do you think about that? Like this idea that, you know, it's like you, you might have these, you know, religious ideas, this legal principles, and is, is it, you know, effectively like you're trying to compete and you're in this boxing match, but you've got one arm time behind your back and the other guys, the other competitors in that market, they've got both their hands. How, how do you sort of, how does that work when you kind of pull it all together? I remember reading a comment that another Islamic banker had made. He said, Islamic finance or Islamic banking in particular is like trying to play American football uh, in a swimming pool. So you got all this gear on you. So you're trying to play water polo, but you're wearing this helmet and this padding and all this stuff that restricts your movement. And I thought that was a pretty fair analogy um, because there are a significant number of parameters. Um, the one that we never thought about 20, 25 years ago was sound money versus fiat money. I didn't really have a concept. Look, I was a standard investment banker. I'd been brought up in, you know, with the received wisdom of fiat economics, you know, neoliberal economics of, uh, you know, having this received wisdom handed down through the generations since the early 20th century. And this is just the way business is done. So we never stopped to think about, okay, we're creating a system of finance that is supposed to be ethical, that is supposed to be risk sharing, that is supposed to be real economy based on real jobs, real wealth creation, not pieces of paper shuffling around creating intangible derivative contracts. That's the essence of Islamic finance. It's meant to be about the real economy and it's meant to be financing businesses on a risk sharing basis. So you share the profits and losses. It's not a case of, here you are, I'll give you $100,000 or a million dollars, and you've got to give me a 10% plus in exchange. It's just an exchange of money for money with a bit of money extra coming back to you. That's what riba is. Riba means excess or surplus. 
and we loosely translate that as interest. But it means a lot more than that. It's actually an asymmetric relationship where the borrower and lender are not equal partners. One is the master and one is the servant. So I think we never really stopped to think about that in those early days. And we just considered, you know what, Islamic finance is just about creating halal or religiously permissible contracts on top of this banking basis. But I never stopped to think about that. And over time, I started to feel that, look, I'm trying to incorporate these risk sharing arrangements within a banking environment. But we always seem to be coming back to a debt relationship. So we created these sukuk, these Islamic bonds, and we tried to make them so that the bond has a maturity. But in theory, you're, at least under an Islamic economic model, you're supposed to repay the market value of the bond back to investors at maturity. What actually was happening was the bankers created this additional contract called a purchase undertaking, and they would guarantee effectively to repay the full par value of your bond. So where's the risk? Right? The risk became the credit risk of the obligor. Well, hang on, that's no different from a conventional bond then. So it be, it's as much as people like me tried to introduce true risk sharing concepts into Islamic finance back in those days, it was pretty much, we felt, virtually impossible to do that within a banking environment because a banking environment is a fractional reserve banking system in which the banker gets his money back, whatever happens, come hell or high water. So that, I think, was the problem. We were trying to play water polo wearing American football gear or, you know, knocking a, 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 a square peg into a round hole. And despite our efforts, I don't think we were able to get to that point. And then in 2017, I was delivering a lecture, and I often deliver lectures on Islamic finance, and somebody in the audience asked me, what do you think about Bitcoin? And I said, I, I'm really sorry, I, I don't know anything about it. And in, in my head, it was sort of a magic internet money. And I said, you're going to have to explain it to me because I don't know enough. And he said, and he explained all the characteristics, you know, it's, uh, it's decentralized, it's got a high stock to flow ratio, it's divisible, it's secure, it's censorship resistant, it's, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, wait a minute, so it sounds a little bit like a modern form of gold, a digital gold. He said, yeah, that's basically what people are calling it. I said, okay, I'm going to have to go away and research this because I understand gold to be a form of money that has been Islamically significant over 1400 years and in fact it defined a period of 700 years of what you know scholars will describe as the islamic golden age when there was a great advancement of learning of culture of science of astronomy of mathematics of learning of even translating greek philosophers that's what the islamic scholars brought to the table for 700 years it was a time of great advancement in civilization of low time preference right why was that the case? I believe that it was because it was a period of a gold dinar standard, a period of low time preference defined by a non-inflationary form of money. And therefore, people think of gold as being the ideal Islamic form of sound money. And when this guy said to me, you know, Bitcoin is like this, I said, okay, I've got to go away and research this. And from that day on, I became a Bitcoiner. And I realized the reason why we are failing to create true Sharia compliant products on a fractional reserve basis is because fractional reserve basis exists because of fiat money. And as long as fiat money is created in the process of credit creation, of lending by banks, you cannot have a truly risk sharing, real economy basis for finance, which is what Islamic finance is supposed to be. And in fact, even nowadays, I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to use the phrase Islamic finance, because I think it's a form of finance that is universal for everybody, should be universal for everybody. And everybody should buy into the concept of finance, which is ethical, which doesn't finance unethical things, and also is real economy based. It's not the creation of intangible derivatives, paper upon paper upon paper, which ultimately led to the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And is risk sharing where you have a symmetric relationship between the financier and the financee. 
So they are partners in an investment relationship, which ultimately leads to better investment decisions. Right now, we're in a situation where money is cheap, money is plentiful, money is printed, money devalues over time. So if you're a VC, you want to get rid of it as fast as possible, and you end up making poor decisions, frankly. What if we had a, a monetary system that nudged us towards better investment decisions, where our hurdle rate was a deflationary currency? Now, if you have that as a hurdle rate, and a unit of account. Now you're making, you're forced to make better investment decisions. So this was a sort of epiphany for me. This was a moment at which I said, you know what? If you combine the principles of Islamic finance with a sound monetary basis, and at the moment I believe Bitcoin is perhaps the most Islamic form of money ever created, better than gold, at least gold in the way that it's, it's, uh, it's used today then I think you have an ultimate ethical financial system. Back to the show in a moment. This show brought to you by CoinKite.com, the creators of the best Bitcoin hardware security devices, such as the cold card Mark IV and the new cold card Q. Now, we use Bitcoin hardware security devices to keep our keys offline, our private keys offline. Now, the way these work is you can do that setup, write down your 12 or 24 words on the, the seed word cards and keep that secure. Now you can use this device to interact with the Bitcoin network using software such as Sparrow Wallet, Electrum, or Vector Desktop, or Nunchuck as a few examples. Now you have a range of security features that you can use with these devices such as passphrases, you can use Seed XOR, or my favorite is multi-signature. Now if you're starting in a basic way, just start with the device and the USB-C cable, plug it directly to the computer and use it that way, and then later improve your setup. But I believe these devices are great at helping secure your coins, especially as you start to migrate up into multi-signature security. But don't be disheartened or don't be uh, scared away. They are accessible, and I think you actually do learn about Bitcoin in the process. So to get yours, go to coinkite.com, use code Levera to get a discount on your cold card. The lead sponsor of this show is Bold, the best place to buy, sell, and save Bitcoin. For listeners in the US, Bold lets you secure your financial future with complete peace of mind by integrating a low-fee, Bitcoin-only brokerage with next-gen multi-sig vaults. With Bold, you can smash buy Bitcoin or set a DCA plan for only 0.99% fees and seamlessly deposit the Bitcoin direct to your Bold Vault. The Bold Vault is a two or three collaborative multi-sig where you hold two keys and Bold holds one as a redundant backup, protecting against loss or theft. You can use Trezor, Ledger or Cold Card hardware wallets to spin up a Bold Vault in just a few minutes and the Bold Vault is the only collaborative custody vault available with zero monthly fees. They're also offering zero fees on your first $10,000 of Bitcoin buys and $25 of free Bitcoin when you buy $100 of Bitcoin or more. Try Bold today and upgrade your stacking experience over at getbold.io. And now, back to the show. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting, great points you made there. Let me take a spin on it this way. Theory and practice right now. Mm. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. I think it's going to change the world. I think it's going to be something closer to a full reserve banking system. But let me, just for the sake of argument, we could sort of say, okay, you've got gold system, you've got the fiat system and the Bitcoin system. Yeah. Theoretically, theoretically, it's possible to create fiat fractional reserve style systems on top of each of them. Or it's also theoretically possible. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but you could theoretically have a full reserve fiat system. Right, yeah. you could theoretically do that. Now, of course, yeah. that's not <laughs> that's not what that's not the world we're in. But yeah. isn't it interesting that you you know you could create both kinds of systems, right? That you could create the kind of full reserve, more sound kind of system, you know, in theory, or you could have the uh, obviously the fractional reserves, like even historically in gold, you know, there were people who created you know little paper claims of gold, but actually they created more claims than what they had back in their vault. And so in yeah. practice, the system became fractional. Even in Correct. Bitcoin's history right now, of course, I don't want this to happen, but there have been, you know, Mt. Gox, FTX, Quadriga CX, I mean, you name it. There have been examples where people thought they had a full claim, but actually they didn't. Uh, yeah. Now, I think the, the saving grace in Bitcoin land is it gets found out, right? Sooner or later, it gets found out and then 
you know, the people who unfortunately, you know, uh, get wrecked are the ones who trusted that particular system. Yeah. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts to share there in terms of, you know, the type of the money is one yeah. thing, but the actual type of the banking system we have on top of that is another altogether, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, this is a very difficult discussion to have with a lot of incumbents in the Islamic finance space because they're quite, I guess, establishment. They're quite uh, acquiescent to what governments tell them is good for them. So yeah. if governments say, you know, this is our regulatory system and these are our trusted intermediaries and we regulate those trusted intermediaries, it's all good. I'm one of those people who is naturally skeptical of that. And I'm a firm believer in self-custody, for example, or I, I'm, I'm, I've now become a believer in the idea of multi-institutional custody. I do think that that, is, that has a very uh, powerful uh, uh, story for many users of Bitcoin going forward, and it'll be part of the important infrastructure of Bitcoin going forward. So, uh, and I and I appreciate that not everybody has you know is necessarily um, you know technically proficient at this stage to be comfortable with self custody. Yes, it's entirely human. Human beings are human beings. Human beings are greedy by nature. You know, we are going to create a fractional reserve system on top of Bitcoin. The question is to what extent? Because at the moment, it's 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 on steroids, right? The fiat. Uh, fractional reserve banking system is a system that's completely out of control. And I would like to think there's a part of me that's very optimistic that says because of the incredible need for proof of work within a Bitcoin system, the ability to create Bitcoin from nothing just doesn't exist. Yeah, you can have pieces of paper floating in the economy, which are not necessarily backed up one to one buy it, you know, at Bitcoin, it, you know, safely held in custody. But you have this, you have a natural check. On the one hand, I think the idea of having, for example, Bitcoin ETFs right now is positive because, you know, people who are not so familiar with self-custody and or who need to put it into the 401k, uh, you know, or into their SIP in the UK, we have self-invested pension plans. You know, this gives them an opportunity to invest on a retail basis in, in Bitcoin. Um, so I think it's good from that point of view. On the other hand, I would hope that once people start doing that, they realize there are better ways to custody Bitcoin, better ways to, to hold it. And, you know, that they realize that this concept of trust versus verify is something that is fundamental to the uniqueness of Bitcoin. Even if they were to use gold as a monetary system, they still require a trusted intermediary. And I would hope as the education you know, improves that amongst retail buyers, that you, you see a move away from the, the establishment banking system and uh, the financial players like BlackRock to provide these pieces of paper that apparently are backed by real Bitcoin towards a self-custody model. There's no way I can predict that. No one has a crystal ball. I don't know which way it will be set. Will it, will it become more like the fractional reserve banking system, you know, or will it become a truly unique self-custody sound money system? I don't know. I'm an optimist, so I'd like to hope the latter. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and I th look, I think uh, it's probably fair to say that there will be a lot of custodial users, but I think it's also fair to say that larger value, let's say whales and institutions will have it more feasible for them to self-custody. And so yeah. it may be a system where there's a lot of individual smaller users and maybe they are custodial for better or worse. Now, of course, I want as many people to self-custody. It's just in practice, I recognize there'll be limits. And like you said, there'll be technical considerations for people you know, cost considerations for people. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say for larger value hodlers, they will be able to self-custody or do some form of multi-institutional custody or maybe some kind of hybrid thing where maybe they hold one or two keys and somebody else is holding a few keys. And that in that way, it's kind of decentralized a bit in that way. Um, yeah. And yeah, I my suspicion is that Gold ultimately 
politically failed in the sense that not everybody could easily self-custody. And because of that, the centralization of custody happened with gold. So then most yeah. of it ended up with in you know government central bank vaults yeah. and a lot of it in the US government Fort Knox vault. And then that's yeah. how the system got captured and fractionalized on top of that. Whereas I believe in Bitcoin, I think it's going to be a different you know, now, none of us knows for sure, but I think that's the tendency that Bitcoin is pushing towards. So that's where I see a distinction in the, let's say, the fractional reserve system you know, of today, of the fiat world, versus what I believe is the full reserve system that we're moving into. But you know, at the same time, it's going to take time to get there, it, you know, won't it? It's not just going to happen <laughs> even in, in a, you know, another four years. No, I think it's, it might be 10 to 20 years on the low end. Uh, but I'm curious... Uh, you know, how you're seeing that? You know, I have a particular perspective because I'm a Muslim myself. You know, a lot of my interactions are in the Middle East. Um, a lot of the people that I speak to about Bitcoin are Muslims themselves. Um, you often come up against the, the deep skeptic um, and you mention Bitcoin and uh, it's as if it triggers something. And, you know, they've heard the FUD, you know, it's, it's uh, money laundering, it's terrorism money, it's... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, there are a few whales who control the prize. Uh, it's magic internet money, the usual fud that you hear. And of course, there is a, a sound rebuttal against each of those points. But one of the particular uh, challenges that I have in orange pilling Muslims about uh, Bitcoin, remember there's 2 billion of them. So that's a very large potential anchor group for, uh, you know, evangelizing the concept of Bitcoin. Um, one of the challenges I have with them is that many sincerely believe, based on scripture, that gold is the only sound form of money, the only Islamic form of money, because they've, they've read many scriptures that mention gold. And there's one very famous tradition, it's called Hadith, uh, which is a collection of the traditions and, and sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And one of those is, um, with gold, silver, barley, wheat, dates, and salt, they may only be exchanged hand to hand, meaning at spot price and no increase on the deferred payment. In other words, you can't charge interest on them. And it's often misinterpreted <clears throat> by many Muslims to say, oh, look, this says only these things may be money. But that's not what it means. It means things that are used as money may not be exchanged for a higher value later. Right. You can't create interest on them because then you're not taking any risk. You're not. You're not financing an underlying venture as such. You're just asking for more back in return. And that means rich people get richer and poor people get poorer. So it's a bad thing to do. So they misinterpret it. And they say, okay, we can only have gold. Gold is the only traditional Islamic form of money. And I say, that's not true at all. You misinterpret it. And yes, gold is mentioned because, of course, Bitcoin didn't exist 1,400 years ago. But if you look at the characteristics of Bitcoin, you see that it has the characteristics of gold but potentially even better. So perhaps it's even more sound form of money. Perhaps it's even more Islamic. And that's the argument that I put to Muslims and say, the characteristics of it are such that it would produce a better world, a more harmonious world, a more ethical world, a world in which you don't have these players that we call banks who are the masters of this financial universe. And we're all slaves to those masters. You would have a much more uh, equitable relationship between these parties. We would be partners. They would finance us as partners and we would share in the risks, share in the profits and the losses, and they'd be forced to do extra due diligence on our ventures. So you wouldn't be throwing away your money at bad ventures. So these are the arguments that I use. And I try to convince them that, you know, this idea that gold is the only thing that we can return to. Well, you know, it's heavily manipulated. It's deeply centralized. You know, you require trusted intermediaries. It's a cost of storage and transportation and et cetera, et cetera. Bitcoin is click your fingers and it's on the other side of the world. You could send a billion dollars worth to the other side of the world. And it would be extremely safe if you self-custody or if you use multi-institutional custody and you've got three parties holding a key. This is incredibly safe. You're not subject to sanctions. I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, with my name, my bank account regularly gets frozen with completely innocuous transactions and I have to keep justifying them, you know, and, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being censored. I know many Muslim businesses who get censored regularly. In the UK, charities 
Muslim charities get censored regularly and their bank accounts have extra scrutiny applied to them, you know, for, for doing things like helping the homeless or whatever it is. So this is something that I think people who are underbanked, you know, who are less represented for the global South in particular, I think it's an incredible form of freedom money. The gold simply can't offer them. And that's the argument that I use with Muslims. Great. And I think you were also touching on some of the cultural differences. And this is something I've often spoken about as well. The cultural differences between operating and living on the fiat standard versus what I believe the future will be on a full reserve Bitcoin standard. Mm. I'm curious if you have any thoughts there in terms of how you explain that for people. Because let me put it this way. When we operate in the fiat fractional reserve system, people are, because of the leverage associated, there's often always this incentive for people to just go and take on more leverage, right? Because if we think from an accounting or a finance perspective, if we think about the cash on cash re return that we get when we're using leverage, it's just, it just magnifies. And so yeah. nowadays, it's very, very common for entrepreneurs and investors to use this kind of leverage effect, even if they didn't necessarily strictly need to, but because it enhances their return from a leverage perspective. So can you, uh, I'm sure you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about that. What is the difference that's going to take place in society once we you know, change that leverage effect to... Yeah. A full reserve system. This is um, this is a particular uh, obsession of mine, you could call it. So the company that I run, CCM, uh, Cordoba Capital Markets, its its purpose is to create a form of trade finance or working capital that is truly risk sharing. Now, of course, it exists in the fiat world. Okay, it doesn't do it on a Bitcoin basis, um, but the way we are trying to do it is as a, a complete alternative to the banking system. So what we say to good quality companies is, you have a particular trade. We will raise money to finance that particular trade. So it's trade finance or working capital, or supply chain financing, whatever you want to call it. And what we'll do is we'll create a capital markets instrument listed on an exchange somewhere, but it will not be a debt. That instrument will not pay a simple coupon on a regular basis that is fixed. Again, come hell or high water. In fact, it will be based on whether that trade is successful or not. So the trade makes money, you share the profits with your investors. We'll try and make sure that we build in as many uh, structural, operational, um, let's say, uh, uh, restraints on the downside so that investors have some assurance their money's being handled well. So capital controls, uh, you know, making sure that we follow through the the flow of cash from start to finish, various KPIs and are in place, a level of due diligence that a banker would not do. So we are, with, we are with the company through every step of that trade journey, and we can follow it from start to finish. And at the end, we have a reasonable assurance that there's going to be a profit made on a high quality trade. That level of due diligence, those controls that we put in place, and the upside sharing are unique in this industry because bankers do debt. Bankers don't do what we call PPNs, profit participating notes. And that's a particular obsession of mine because that's a return to the roots of trade, which I think are fundamental to Islamic finance. And if I can marry that with a Bitcoin monetary base, I think we have the ultimate form of, and again, I'm, I, I want to be careful using the word Islamic finance because I just think it's good finance. I think everybody should use it. But what then ends up happening is, the company that you invest in and the investors are now aligned. Their incentives are aligned. There's not an asymmetric relationship between them. And these aligned uh, partners now have an incentive to grow an economy in a wholesome way. So in the Middle East particularly, we are finding that many business owners, uh, family offices, high net worth, uh, heads of families are saying, I'm really interested in this PPN because I'm very uncomfortable. There's, a, there's a, a level of discomfort culturally with debt in general. And they say, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of debt on my balance sheet. It doesn't help me to sleep at night. You know, the idea that I have to pay back a bank 
whatever happens so that they're not taking on the risk and I'm taking on all the risk. But I do like the idea of being a partner with investors, with an instrument that in some senses looks a little bit, the format looks a little bit like a bond. It's listed on exchange. It pays out a regular payment, but that payment is based on what we are actually doing. And the way that the financier is measuring our performance, I like it because we're now in a healthy way moving towards uh, the same goal. So culturally, I think that this form of finance is really uh, something that's well suited to particularly the Middle East. But I think in general, I mean, we're finding businesses in the US and the UK who are very interested in it, and investors who are very interested in those two jurisdictions and saying, you know, I do feel uncomfortable with finance. These are often owner-managed businesses, right? So they don't want to dilute their equity because they own the business. They don't want to raise money that way. And they don't want to take on bank debt because it doesn't help them to sleep at night. So they think, how can I do this in a way that's wholesome, that helps me to sleep at night, in which I have partners, my financiers are my partners. I'm not beholden to them in some other way. And I, I think that leads to a very healthy economy in which risk is shared and in, incentives are aligned and everybody rises up together. I mean, I think this is about leveling up um, and it's difficult to quantify the effect of that. But I think ideologically, there are a lot of people who are getting behind that idea. Yeah. So I'm just curious then, what happens when things break down or let's say the project is not successful? Um, what's like, what's the recourse there? How, how, how does that then play out for the investors who've chipped in money? Um, how does that work? Well, there's four circumstances in which they would get their money back uh, against a pledge of typically inventory or shares. And those circumstances are fraud. Uh, they could be negligence, they could be breach of contract, and they could be insolvency. So if you've put your money into a specific trade and not directly related to that trade, but for some other reason, so the company collapses for some other reason, you have a pledge over uh, you know, certain things, whether that's shares or property or inventory or whatever it is. However, as an investor, you are taking market risk. So if the world price of, I don't know what it is you're financing, let's say it's coffee beans, if the world price of coffee beans collapses, you are taking a market risk. Right. Maybe there's some uh, protections in place. So for example, you we have one deal where we're dealing with Brazil nuts, for example, and we make sure that the trading account that we control does not release money to the company to buy the raw materials, which they then process in their factory, until we've seen pre-sold contracts with wholesale buyers. So we have a reasonable degree of comfort that actually this, there's going to be a profit made. So we see that there's some contracts that are locked in. We release the money from the trading account and out it goes and the profit is made. Now, that's not a capital guarantee because there is a time lag between the money going in and the trade being made, but it does reduce some of that uh, discomfort that investors, investors are used to seeing debt. They're used to seeing capital guarantees. They're used to seeing guaranteed returns. They're used to saying, what's my security here? So we need to give them some level of comfort, but we have to do it in a Sharia compliant way where a, a risk is being taken and incentives are aligned. And this is a real economy transaction. So there is some market risk for sure. This show brought to you by mempool.space, the world's leading Bitcoin visualizer. And now they've got an accelerator program. So if you have a transaction that you sent at a fee that was too low to get confirmed, now you can fix this at, with the mempool accelerator. The way it works, you can go and search your transaction, scroll down, click accelerator, and you don't need an account. You can pay with lightning and then it'll show you it's now in the process of being accelerated. And then after a few minutes, it's confirmed. And so this is a great way to help you out if you are stuck. And this can happen where maybe your wallet doesn't have RBF or CPFP, or it might help you in situations where it's impractical to go and re-sign. So for example, multi-seek with keys in different locations. And thirdly, even in some lightning scenarios, perhaps a force close, you might not be able to use RBF. And so in this case, the mempool accelerator can help you out. So keep it in mind, and you can find out more over at mempool.space slash accelerator. And now back to the show. On the investor side, are you able to share just to, like uh, just at a rough, I mean, without doxing specific, you know, uh, examples, but are you able to share like a rough idea of what kind of return investors will end up seeing if they participate in these kinds of yeah, things? Sure. I mean, we're targeting 10 to 16 percent per annum yield. Uh, against trades which are, uh, I, in my opinion, the benchmark here is sukuk or Islamic bonds. And typically, if you buy an Islamic bond, 
you're buying an investment grade uh, rated instrument listed on an exchange somewhere. It's often a sovereign issuance or a very large corporate, you know, an entity like Emirates Airline, for example. Um, and you're typically earning low single digit, four, maybe 5% per annum. My view is you're, if you're buying a corporate school, you're actually taking on a level of risk that many investors don't properly understand. Uh, and this was borne out some years ago when a, a real estate operator in Dubai called Nakhil issued a sukuk that uh, paid 7%. And people thought, oh, 7%, that's a nice return. But actually, you had no real ability to enforce over apparent underlying assets under that sukuk, which is a patch of land uh, you know, being built in, in Dubai. Um, and so therefore, the level of return you were getting was not high enough for the level of risk you were taking. And I found that with many sukuk, there's this expectation from investors who haven't read the documents in detail that they're going to get their money back like a bond. Whereas, in fact, they're, they're taking on a level of risk that I don't think has been properly assessed. And what we're trying to do is to try and we're trying to deliver a similar level of risk, but roughly double or triple the level of yield against that. So the range will be 10 to 16 percent. In fact, in our first two deals, we've delivered an average of 16 and a half percent yield. You know, so we think that's very good. I don't think that that's, by the way, and that's pretty high. We were predicting eight to thirteen percent. That's what we were we were predicting the range would be. Of course, you can't guarantee a return. So you say to investors, our expectation is eight to thirteen percent, and we ended up delivering plus over sixteen percent. So you know, I think that's a good start, and uh, you know, we'll we'll continue to uh, suggest a range of sort of ten to maybe sixteen percent at the very high end. But you know, that's the kind of trade return that we expect to give our investors at a little bit more market risk than a typical sukuk, but many of the similar downside risks like insolvency protection, bankruptcy remote, segregated uh, bank accounts, you know, an, an SPV issuer that's regulated in a well-known jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, interesting. And so the other aspect that you touched on is the due diligence and the, let's say, it's, it's, it's more hands-on, let's say. And right. so that obviously implies certain things that, you know, this would be for, you know, larger businesses, more professionalized, you know, this yeah. is not just for like kind of mom and dad shop down the road kind of, you know, level. Yeah. There's a certain level of size and, um, you know, there's a certain level of size required to make these kinds of things sort of operate. And I think to me, one thing that I've, noticed let's say in the fiat world today is that a lot of these cheap fiat loans are actually just government subsidized right like that's yeah. really when you think about what happened in you know even in the us the gfc talking about you know F F uh, fannie mae and freddie mac these are basically government entities that subsidize loans for the everyday people to just buy houses Right. And yeah. so there's kind of different segments of the market. And I, I wonder whether, you know, in the future, if we have a full reserve sort of um, style of banking and, you know, finance, like we're talking about, it might only be at certain size, you know, or a certain kind of scale that maybe mom and dad shop it might not be as feasible. But I'm curious where you see that. Like, it, do you see that maybe in the future, you yeah. know, this kind of thing could apply even for smaller businesses? You know, I'm hopeful that the technique that we've developed will trickle down. At the moment, we have to apply it to medium-sized companies, you know, typically turnover over $10 million per annum, up to $200 million, um, uh, with very tight criteria, you know, very strong supplier chains, you know, very good market position, a, a global international star, you know, something we, we think will be the, the next big thing. So we apply very strict criteria to the companies that we help finance. I would like to see the technique trickle down to smaller medium enterprises. I want to see this technique used for smaller businesses. I can't do it today because I don't have the resources to do that. But once I have the resources to do that, you can be sure that I'm going to apply it to smaller and smaller businesses. And, you know, actually, we can structure it so that the default rates are very, very low. Because I think at the moment, you're quite right. There's so much, when, whenever you have a subsidy, you, you take away the element of due diligence. You know, because now someone else is picking up part of the tab. But where you have to align yourself, where the investor and the investee are aligned, you have to be extra careful. We spend several months with our clients beforehand assessing whether they are ready to issue a capital markets instrument. 
Bankers don't do that. I mean, in my time at Deutsche and then Barclays, you know, we typically spent a month or two doing our analysis, due diligence, financial mm. statements, really. We weren't doing trade finance analysis. We were just looking at the big picture, you know, and we, within a month, you can click your fingers and issue a bond. Now, that's not a lot of due diligence, whereas we spent several months doing this. So if you have a system, again, of low time preference where the financier sits down embedded within a company and says, right, take me through all of your processes. I want to meet everybody here. I want to go through the whole process. I want to see how you generate a return to investors. And I want to monitor that through the lifetime of the financial instrument. I don't want to just walk away at the end of it and let investors just, you know, hopefully they'll get their money back. No, I want to be part of the process going forward to so every three months, I'm going to assess all of these KPIs. That's a very different process. And I want to see that become the new standard, at least in the Islamic finance industry, if not in all of finance. I don't know if we're going to get there, but that's my ambition. Yeah. Um, so I've got two other questions there. Um, let's start on this question. So what we've been talking about, as you said, is trade finance. Now, you know, you came from this world of you know, finance where there's all these other forms of finance that exists. So I'm curious, are some of those forms of finance not going to exist in the full reserve Bitcoin future? Do you think that maybe only some of these forms are actually going to be viable? I wonder whether venture capital as it exists today would continue to exist under a Bitcoin standard because the hurdle rate is now Bitcoin itself. And therefore the level of due diligence, the level of analysis you know, we're throwing uh, currently, you know, good money after bad. If you're lucky, you'll hit one in 10 projects. And, uh, you know, I, I don't invest in VC firms. I don't, uh, VC is not part of my personal pension or, or retirement fund. You know, it's just too risky for me and I don't trust them. I don't, I don't understand why they make the decisions that they do. Well, I, I do understand it's because they have high time preference, right? They have to just throw money away. Otherwise, it's losing value. Um, so I, I do think that VC, the VC industry must change under a sound money standard. Um, the banking industry in general, I mean, at the moment, you have an ability to create money from nothing. Credit creation leads to money creation. Obviously, under a Bitcoin standard, you can't do that. So again, you are forced to make high quality investment decisions in which you align with the financed party. I, I think that there's a potential for Bitcoin banking, and I'm reluctant slightly to use the word banking, but Bitcoin financing is a very different process. It's more like true VC, you know, true private equity, where you are investing in the profits and losses of a business and not merely financing a line of credit and creating new money in the process because you can't create new money in the process. So I'm hopeful that we'll move a model. As I said before, we can't account for human greed and people will find ways to create interest bearing contracts on a Bitcoin standard. Of course they will. But hopefully that'll be much reduced because of proof of work. It becomes much harder to create money from nothing or effectively, you know, create pieces of paper backed by nothing. Um, so I, I'm, again, I'm hopeful about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you made a lot. You think you explained it well. Um, as an example, like even for me, thinking back to my university finance courses and things like this, people talked about, as an example, the LBO, the leverage buyout, right? So that was like another thing that was kind of common from the investment banking world that may go away in the full reserve future because the whole right. concept leveraged buyout, right? Like I'm yeah. only going to put up 5% or 10% of the capital yeah. and borrow 90%. That's yeah. clearly not going to be like you know, or the, the amount of return that I would need to be anticipating back from that is just so high that I don't know that it would exist in a full reserve world. So that's one example. I think it would be very hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you a specific example, actually. Um, with Deutsche, about, I guess, 15 years ago, we did the largest uh, leverage buyout uh, in the Middle East. It happened to be also the largest ever Sharia compliant leverage buyout. And it was a company called Egyptian Fertilizers Company. Uh, and a private equity fund was uh, fund was buying this uh, this company, um, and of course, it, it, because the fund was a Sharia compliant fund, it had to be done on a Sharia compliant basis. Now, in in my industry, there is um, uh, there's a lot of synthetic stuff that goes on. So a lot of Islamic banks are essentially entering into a, a particular type of contractual relationship called commodity murabaha. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter exactly what that means. Just to know that it's basically a proxy for a loan with interest. And the bankers have done some very clever manipulation to make this apparently halal contract 
look halal, but actually it's based on a very dubious underlying structure. We recognized that and we said, okay, what's a real economy way of financing this leverage buyout? And we said, well, here's a company that you're buying. <clears throat> it manufactures a particular product, which is fertilizer. What if Deutsche Bank, as the financier, enters into a forward purchase of the product, the manufactured product of this company? So we, we give $800 million as this tranche of finance, and we effectively buy $800 million worth of bags of fertilizer to be produced over the next seven years, which is the maturity of this financial instrument. Now you've got a real economy transaction because now you're saying, I'm actually buying something that you manufacture. Now, this, this doesn't literally mean that, you know, in seven years' time or over the course of seven years, you have you know, $800 million worth of bags of fertilizer turn up at the door of Deutsche Bank in London, right? That doesn't, it doesn't literally mean that because you have an off-taker. So as long as you can have some assurance about who that off-taker is, you on-sell these bags of real economy produce. Now, that's an example of uh, effectively a full reserve financial instrument, which is backed by a real commodity. And I think that's a very ethical form of finance because now you are financing the real economy without, I mean, clearly there's a lot of um, financial structuring behind this and it's very hard to get people on side within an investment bank. And we had a hell of a time trying to convince our colleagues that this was a good trade. And actually you can, you can mitigate a lot of the risk in this, um, but you have a real economy trade underpinning your financial instrument. So it's possible to do a leveraged buyout on a true 100% backed real economy risk sharing basis. And we proved it, but sadly the industry has stagnated since then. We don't tend to see that kind of transaction anymore. Yeah, and as you uh, w certainly appreciate, we are still today swimming in the fiat waters, right? So even yeah. if we try to have one particular transaction that's full reserve, the kind of the broader waters that we're swimming in are fiat fractional reserve, and so that's kind of driving may, perhaps some of the returns. And even you know, as we talked about, the VC model uh, it certainly relies, at least in today's world, it relies on people taking these highly speculative bets, right? That these angel investors and VC investors are kind of, they're putting in money into startups that they know maybe 10 of them, nine out of 10 of them are gonna fail, but they're hoping that one of them is like the 100X or the 1000X that repays um, for all the others. Uh, and then even when it comes to things like certain types of private equity, like the kind of roll up form of private equity, where the idea is, okay, let me buy some of these different entities, roll them together into one entity, and then hopefully the valuation multiple on the joint entity is much higher. Therefore, I'm going to get my money out of that. Yeah. So, you know, that's, again, it's kind of, I don't know how much of that, uh, you know, certainly in the future, there may be some return that comes from economies of scale, certainly. But maybe it won't be enough to justify the, you know, these huge leverage uh, uh, opportunities that exist you know, in, in the fiat world today, especially when rates are low. I think that's probably the other big thing is when rates are low, you start to see all these crazy behaviors, right? Yeah. Yeah. In a, in a weird sense, it's actually helpful for rates to go up in order for people to see the benefit of a real economy transaction. Um, I, I hate to say that because I, I, as a Muslim, I don't want to see interest rates at all. You know, I want them to be zero. I don't want banks to make money out of money. But um, you know, it, it, as I say, in a weird sense, it's actually quite helpful for the business that I'm doing right now. Um, whether we can completely get away from financial structuring as investment banks and private equity firms do today, where they aim to extract value from a business, not from the real economy trade itself, not from the business itself, but from, uh, you know, restructuring the balance sheet in some arcane way. Uh, which I, I, you know, this is something that I, I'd like to see us move away from. And I'd like to think that getting onto a sound money standard and using risk sharing techniques will move us away from that and move us towards real economy being the master and the financial economy being the servant. Whether that will happen, I don't know. Yeah. So one, I guess, tragic question or way to frame this is also how 
can a person be moral in today's age, right? Like you, you could say, oh, it's difficult to, you know, get a house without a mortgage uh, and participate in the fiat system. Or even you're know, coming back to that example before of, you know, the NFL guy, you know, underwater or the mm-hmm. guy, the boxer who's got one arm tied behind his back. So even if you're trying to be a moral upstanding person, we're kind of stuck in this world as it is today. So what are some of the ways that, you know, people, uh, you know, are trying to, you know, proceed in that world. Yeah. You know, this is going to sound a little bit uh, corny, and I'm sure many of your viewers will start rolling their eyes at this point. But I've observed something about people who forswear debt, and particularly interest-bearing debt. And particularly in my community, when I see people who <clears throat> finance their businesses uh, with a lot of riba, with a lot of interest, um, they don't sleep very well. They, there's a lot of stress in their lives, and that stress is reflected in their personal relationships, in their financial dealings, in their daily lives. And when I see them move away from riba-based debt, interest-based debt, I see the burden lifted from them. I see this with my own eyes. You know, it's, it's something that I can't quantify. I can't put a number on it. I can't put a finger on it. I can only tell you it's a, this is a vibe that I get. When I see people who have taken debt away from their lives, they sleep better and their personal relationships improve and their family lives improve and their daily lives improve. You know, this is something that it's, it's hard for me to, to articulate. But personally, I am convinced, and it's a belief, you know, it's no more than that. I am convinced that people who move away from interest-bearing debt and move towards a more wholesome form of finance. They just lead better lives. They're just healthier. They're just happier. Um, and you know, the measure of human progress nowadays is just GDP. It's a crude way of measuring human progress. It's the value of goods and so the exchange value of goods and services, not the experiential value of human life. We don't measure suicide rates and divorce rates and literacy rates and environmental pollution and so on within GDP. We only measure this very blunt metric, which is exchange value of goods and services. You know, if that's our only metric for human life, we're, we're going to fail, you know, as a civilization. Or maybe we need to start thinking about other metrics that determine progress in the world. And, and you know, one of those metrics might be the degree to which there is debt in our lives. I was just listening to your podcast with Lawrence, you know, about the U.S. national debt. and. You know, uh, again, it's just something you cannot quantify. Sure, you can say here, here is what the national debt is, but how has that impacted daily life for people on the ground? You know, how do we measure that in terms of these things like literacy and suicide rates and divorce rates and happiness? How do you measure happiness? So uh, I don't know if that's a that's kind of a hokey answer for you, but you know, that, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point to make, and certainly we can talk about. Uh, as you said, this kind of uh, people mistake economics and especially I, I would say Austrian economics is often mistaken as being kind of homo economicus when actually if you go and read Mises, he talks about how man is not homo economicus, right? He's not just like this soulless automaton thinking, oh, what can I sell this for the maximum and I'll sell my mm-hmm. children away and I'll do all this. No, like it, it's the economy is meant to be how we are living our lives and our, you know, our family lives are yeah. part of that. It's not just about kind of how do I maximize the monetary number gain. Um, and so I think that's an important distinction to make. Of course, you know, we can talk about, okay, so in certain ways we are materially wealthier today for sure, but there yeah. are other ways in which, you know, maybe religious, spiritual or other family moral life, you know, aspects. I'm not yeah. sure the family life has improved. Yeah. Yeah, and you think about how atomized a lot of people are in society today. You look at how, you know, people aren't marrying as often or they're marrying later. When they have mm-hmm. children, they're having children later. They're having less children than they used to. Like, there's yeah. all these other elements of it um, that, you know, I think many of these things will improve uh, in a Bitcoin standard. Uh, one other big question area that I was curious to ask you is around hurdle rates, right? Because... As you know, obviously you're a finance guy yourself, uh, and a lot of Bitcoin hodlers are going to be thinking, well, hey, the last 10 years, if I've hodled my Bitcoin, I got 60% per year. 
that that makes it very difficult uh, to invest in projects. Now, you know, people aren't necessarily all in Bitcoin. Maybe they've got some stack of Bitcoin and they've got another mm-hmm. stack or another area that they're making active investments. So, but where does it all blend together when we're thinking about hurdle rates, uh, you know, in terms of Bitcoin uh, purchasing power growth. Now, of course, to be fair, I'm not saying it's going to be 60% you know, forever. It's obviously, mm-hmm. it's going to taper down. It's obviously, it's obviously also volatile. Some years you lose, many years you win. But if you had to sort of blend it all together, what does it look like in terms of Bitcoin and hurdle rates compared to yeah. today? Yeah, I often hear people say that, oh, you know, it's, it's deflationary, so therefore nobody's ever going to spend it. You're going to stick it in, a, in an account somewhere and you're never going to, you know, <clears throat> and, and the economy will freeze as a result. But that's not true because, you know, tech, uh, the, the, the cost of tech decreases over time. And then we don't say, I won't buy this laptop or this phone today because in a year's time, it's going to be 10% or 20% cheaper. Nobody's, well, maybe some people do, but the majority of people don't. They say, yeah, I actually need a laptop now. So you buy it. Right, even though you know in a year's time it's going to be cheaper. So I don't think that's necessarily an argument that is watertight. And, uh, and so I think this idea that, you know, hodling Bitcoin is, is you know, uh, something that's uh, a, a phenomenon that we're going to have to live with for always. And it's just become a store of value rather than something that's used as a medium of exchange. I think in time we will see it used. And at the moment, so for example, at the moment, my use case for Bitcoin is getting it to parts of the world that the banking rails won't support. Um, so if you want to support aid on the ground in Gaza, for example, you want to save lives and distribute medicines and food to people who are starving and dying of illnesses that are preventable, then Bitcoin is one of the only ways you can do that. And I'm a strong believer in that. Um, so it is being used for certain things. Over time, that use case will become much more like a medium of exchange. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, we do have a, there's a couple of uh, uh, venture funds out there that are using Bitcoin as a, uh, a, a hurdle rate, as a unit of account. Um, so I think we'll start to see the proliferation of these sorts of funds. And we'll start to see venture funds making high quality decision making processes and due diligence um, because they have to. And I think that's a fantastic thing for the economy overall. So, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. It's sometimes hard to quantify the future. It's very hard to quantify the future. But I, I think if we are all optimists, that's helpful because, you know, it's a sort of almost self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and I, I think it's, it's healthy for human beings to be optimists at heart. Yeah, I think that's a great spot to finish. Uh, so, uh, Harris, where can people find you online? I'm on Twitter, uh, Harris Irfan. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Very easy to find me. And uh, I've been doing a podcast with on, on Ramp Mina, uh, which comes out quite regularly. Fantastic. Well, Harris, I enjoyed chatting with you and uh, yeah, hope to chat again soon. Thank you for having me, Stefan.